Let's bring in Jay Billis, ESPN College Basketball Analyst. And in case you forget, he was a very good college basketball player in his own right. Uh, Jay, do you remember your first tournament game when you were at Duke? Yes, we played uh, in Pullman, Washington and stayed in Moscow, Idaho. And so it was not not much of a uh, an introduction into the glory of the tournament. It, we were probably felt like we were more quarantined and isolated <laughs> than the guys in Indianapolis right now. Who was the uh, best player you played against that year? That year, Detlef Frempf. We uh, we played Washington at Washington State in the second round. Uh, that was back before the tournament expanded. So it was 1984. So we had a bye. We didn't play a first round game. Uh, we had a bye into the second round and played uh, played Detlef Shrimp and, and Christian Belp in Washington. How'd you do? They beat us uh, by one. And uh, Johnny Dawkins got fouled on a lob and just taken out and the referee just looked at him like we're in Washington. Son. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how surprised were you reaction to Duke not getting in this year? Not surprised at all. Um, I thought the only shot they had to get to get in, in was, uh, was beating Florida state and, uh, and going to the semifinals of the ACC tournament and playing well there. I don't think they had to win, but they had to play well. And, uh, and the coronavirus thing, uh, uh, having a player test positive took them out of it. So I wasn't surprised at all. What about the COVID contingency plans of what happens during the tournament when the tournament gets started? If a team has to pull out, what happens? Let's say it's an Elite Eight or a Sweet 16. What happens to that matchup? They just move the other one on. So once the tournament starts, everything's locked in. If something happens between now and then, they'll take one of the last four teams in order when the last four teams left out. I think Louisville was the first one. And they'll they'll just put them into that slot no matter what the seed is. So if a you know if a 16 seed goes out uh, because of, of virus issues and cannot play. Uh, then they slot Louisville in there. So a number one seed is going to be going, really? We get Louisville as a 16 seed? That's not fair. That's not fair. But it's just it's the only way they can do it. I mean, I guess theoretically you could you could shift up one bracket and uh, and just reseed it. But it, it that that way everybody has to redo their scouting and their preparation and all that stuff. You're just better off just sticking it to one team rather than the whole bracket. It's kind of like a, a, an airplane flight. Like if you miss a flight or if, if they cancel a flight, they don't, they don't just book everybody on the next one and inconvenience everybody. They just didn't inconvenience that one flight. But are you going to have these four teams that are sort of in the on-deck circle, they're quarantining, practicing, ready to go just in case? That, that's Yes, they're testing uh, and ready. They've, they had to notify the selection committee that they're willing to, to go if they're called. I don't anticipate that happening. Uh, but who knows? There's a lot of things you didn't anticipate. But but you know the conference tournaments. I mean, it it was some big names with Virginia, Duke, and and Kansas having an issue. Uh, but otherwise, everything went off pretty well. I think the I think the biggest issue, Dan, was there was a little bit of trauma there. You know, it was one year basically to the day, and all of a sudden you had a, a few teams drop uh, all you know within 24 hours and it started to, to feel like deja vu all over again a little bit but but you know intellectually you knew that this is not that big of a deal I mean it, it certainly sucks for those teams and their fans and the coaches all that stuff but but it wasn't it wasn't anything going to derail you know the the conference tournaments and uh, TV and all that stuff the, the business is going to go on no matter how many people you know have to have to bow out of this doesn't feel like there's any outrage today normally the day after. You know, we're railing against a team that got in or seated too high or a team that didn't get in. Uh, is there any outrage? No, maybe that's because we're just happy to have it. Uh, but the committee did a pretty good job. I mean, there were some things that that I didn't care for, but nothing where you're going, really? Like, do, are you guys, you know, the ball's round, right? Uh, we've had those in the past. We didn't have that this year. Um, so overall, I think it was pretty good. And, uh, you know, I mean, you could quarrel. There, there are a couple things I don't like that the committee does usually, and that is um, I don't like it when they put uh, mid major against mid major, um, and because you know one of them loses, and you know that's when you go put any time you can put the little guy against a big shot and let's see what happens, because that's what people seem to want, and it is a television event after all, um, and, and they know that too. Um, but overall, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good and pretty balanced. That was the, the best part of it was there's no region you're going, well, that one's a bear and this one's easy. 
um, they all seem seem pretty pretty balanced, which is is I think the 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 number one thing to do for any committee. Jay Billis, ESPN College Basketball Analyst. You mentioned this is a TV show. I was wondering about this. If Zion was still on Duke this year and they were thirteen and eleven, would would the committee look at Duke differently if you had a marquee must see player like that? Well, that's part of the problem, Dan, is if Zion were on Duke's team, they wouldn't be 13 and 11. <laughs> they'd be 24, they'd be 23 and 1. Okay, or come on. Out. All right. Well, that, but that, that, that's the issue with them is they didn't have, they didn't have superstar talent. They had, they had good talent and they were just kind of just like everybody else this year. They had good players and youth and all that. But, you know, so with Kentucky and Duke, you know, people, some people were saying, aha, uh-huh, one and done, doesn't work anymore. Well, it works at Oklahoma State. And it works at Gonzaga and it works at USC. You know, they, they just didn't get the superstars this year. And, and Kentucky and Duke usually do. I wonder about, you know, once we get done with the one and done, how that's going to change what the Blue Bloods do recruiting wise or how that's going to affect the mid majors. Do you, do you see a seismic shift there that now all of a sudden Duke's getting the guy who's going to stay three years? Maybe, but they're also going to get, they'll get the best players uh, anyway, and they'll be more active in the transfer market. Um, That's going to be a bigger deal going forward. You're going to see players that identify themselves as being really good uh, are going to go, well, heck, I can go to Duke or Kentucky now. Uh, And you'll see that more often, but I'm not convinced that one and done is going away. Um, it, 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 you know, you may see other avenues, but um, if if the NCAA wises up or if the Supreme Court says they uh, they have to, um, players are going to be able to make money. And uh, and if they can make money, college is going to be a, a pretty good option. What is your philosophy in filling out a bracket? Mine is um, be careful of the upsets that you're looking for, because, you know, saying the 512 happens, it's picking the right 512. And this year, a lot of the double-digit upsets are going to be major conference teams that are are the double-digit seed, whether it's Rutgers or Syracuse or Michigan State or things like that. Those don't seem to be as appealing. Um, but I, I don't. I look at who I think is going to advance, uh, the team I think that's going to advance uh, in in the bracket, and I don't worry as much about the upsets because those are the first weekend fun things. And you know, when you start thinking about like a uh, a 15 seed or something. Um, two seeds are 132 and eight against 15 seeds. You know, it, it, sometimes it seems like, Hey, those 15, this team can really play. They can play, but they don't win as often as you think. And then they don't win a second game. So when you start thinking about Florida Gulf coast or something, that's great, but it, it, it's happened once. And, uh, and you gotta be, gotta be a little careful of stuff that's only happened once. Gonzaga's chances here of going undefeated, um, you know, obviously it hasn't happened since 1976, but given everything that's happened, uh, is that on the same level as what Indiana did with Bob Knight? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, I, you know, I don't, I, I think the, the field is a little bit younger now than it was back then. That's the only difference between football and basketball. The players now are better than they've ever been. So if Gonzaga played that Indiana team, they'd drill them. Um, and, but, but the players were older. And so that's the only thing that would give them more of a chance. It's like, if you took, you know, the 1972 Nebraska Cornhuskers and they played against, uh, Alabama this year, who do you think would win? Alabama drub them. Um, but, but football hasn't changed. The ages of the players haven't changed. The ages have changed in basketball. That's the only thing that makes it where you could say, okay, the, the teams of yesteryear, uh, would, would do really well against the teams now is because you'd have seniors playing against freshmen at times. You got a surprise team? That's not going to be a surprise if you tell me what your surprise team is? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple. Um, there, like the upsets I see are in the West uh, before they get uh, their season shut down by Gonzaga. I think both uh, UC Santa Barbara and uh, Ohio U are really good picks there. Ohio U's got a player named Jason Preston, the point guard, that is the LaMelo ball of this tournament. Um, He's a triple-double guy. Uh, He averages about 16, 7, and 7. And uh, really, really talented. He's going to be a first-round NBA draft pick. And UCSB has really good guards in addition to a fantastic party area called Isla Vista, (laughs) which is uh, a wonderful place if you're young and want to have a few beers and enjoy yourself. Isla Vista is the place to go. Do you remember the first time you played against Jordan? 
Yes, I, absolutely. Um, it was at a pickup game in Chapel Hill at a place called Woolen Gym. And, uh, and we were, uh, we were the number one ranked recruiting class and we went over to Chapel Hill to play. And, uh, and after, after playing against, you know, Jordan and those guys, we were kind of looking at ourselves going, uh, I don't know if this is going <laughs> to, this might not have been a good decision. And then, and then, you know, like people would say, Hey, did you know in college that Jordan was going to be great? Like, yeah, yeah, we did. We knew, um, you know, it, it, when you played against him and Len Bias and Ralph Sampson, you're kind of going, all right, whoever said all men are created equal, <laughs> that's BS. Like, that's just not true. I try to tell people about Len Bias that, I, you know, he, he, he had that explosion, like Dominique Wilkins type explosion mm-hmm. there. But um, but he could shoot it, too. Yeah. Like he, had a, he was a beautiful jump shooter. He was Superman. Like, like we used to call him Superman because we'd come back to the huddle and, and one of our guys would go, I'm trying to foul him and I can't foul him. <laughs> Did you face Ewing? I did in high school. I played against Patrick Ewing in high school. I don't know if he were, well, he probably remembers it, not because of, of anything to do with me, but we played it in a, a like this all-star event at, at Pepperdine in Malibu. And one of my teammates, a guy named Billy Knox, who played at uh, St. Bernard's High School and then went to St. Mary's, shattered a backboard in uh, in warmups. And so that was, uh, and then and then we wound up playing. So it was, it was, a good, it was fun playing against him. Were you guarding him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He had a good game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if those two things are related. <laughs> I, in a, you know, when you talk about a force in college basketball, I loved Elijah Wan, but, you know, Ewing, his presence and what he meant to the game and his coach and all of those things. And, you know, it's hard to describe it to somebody unless they saw it, they experienced of what Hoya Paranoia was all about. Yeah, Hoya Paranoia, that part of it, and then just how dominant he was as a player that, um, you know, back then the center was was the feared position. And, you know, if you were a dominant center, you were the first pick in the draft. It wasn't a discussion point. And that's why Elijah Wan went number one over Jordan uh, or Sam Bowie went number two. You know, that would never happen today. Uh, but back back then it happened routinely. But when when Ewing dunked it, remember in the title game in, in 82, he was goaltending all these shots and the announcers were going, what is he doing? And, and uh, John Thompson knew exactly. He wanted to let everybody, you know, he wanted Ewing to let everybody know that he was there. And they did. And, and they almost won that game. I wonder what Ralph Sampson would have been like in today's game. It feels like there's a Porzingis type feel to him. He would have been just as dominant as he was back then. Like people forget he was the MVP of the all-star game in 85. He averaged 20 and 10 for a period of years, but then he got hurt. And once his, it was like a thoroughbred uh, horse having bad, bad knees. That's what happened. I, I remember uh, go, I was in Houston doing something in the late eighties and I went to a game and he was with the Sacramento Kings and he couldn't run anymore. Yeah. And I, I was, it was so sad because, you know, he, he was such, he was so great. Like he should have been, he, it was like almost like Walton, you know, with his feet. Um, it diminished what he was as a pro, but both of them uh, were Hall of Famers, Naismith Hall of Famers on their college careers alone. Uh, you know, two of the greatest that have ever played, I think. Who did you pick to win it all? Gonzaga. Oh, yeah, okay. Gonzaga. I think Gonzaga is the best team. Um, and Gonzaga and Illinois, I mean, I think there's going to be a, a little bit of chaos in the in the first weekend. But I think the the top teams are are pretty strong. The one I'm I'm concerned about is Michigan because I, Isaiah Livers has been out, and if he's not back, and then they've got L, they probably have LSU in the second round. Uh, I don't know that LSU is going to get beat by St. Bonaventure, although St. Bonaventure is pretty good. The Fighting Woj bombs, um, but I, I I think I think Michigan is the the only one that uh, that you're going. Oh man, without Livers, maybe maybe they could trip up a little bit. Thanks as always, Jay. Uh, we'll hopefully check in with you during the tournament. And uh, my best to the boys uh, there in Bristol. Should have been Dayton last year, Dan. Yeah, that I know. That would have been a good run, man. I know. Now they're going to the NIT. I know. Sucks. Yeah, I know. I'll... Eastern Kentucky hasn't been the same since you left either. Oh, my God. You know, they have been. Not any good. <laughs> <laughs> Not any good, Jay. And they, yeah, they've been consistent. Thank you, bud. See you, buddy. That's uh, Jay Billis, a former... Uh, Do great.